Good evening and welcome to the 41st annual NITAO lecture. Closed captioning is available at the bottom of your screen. Attendees should type questions into the Q&A section. After we hear from Professor Willoughby Harrard, we will answer questions submitted both before the event as well as during the webinar. We may not be able to get to all of the questions. It is our practice to begin our programs with a land acknowledgement. We would like to take a moment to honor the fact that McAllister is on Dakota land. This is the ancestral homeland of the Dakota people who were forcibly exiled from the land because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota people, ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. McAllister sits near Bedote, the sacred meeting points of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers. In the words of Reverend Jim Bear Jacobs, Bedote is a place of genesis and genocide, both realities alive in the land at once. We recognize that this acknowledgement itself is not enough and only serves as a first step towards decolonization. Today's 41st Mitau lecture's namesake, Professor Theodore Mitau, was born in Berlin in 1920 to a well-established Jewish family. By the age of 14, he had to adorn the Star of David to the clothes he wore to school and soon thereafter realized that further educational possibilities would be severely constrained by Nazi policies towards the Jews. During the mid 1930s, German Jews primarily feared increased discrimination and exclusion. No one had yet thought of genocide. Accordingly, Mitau left for the United States where he completed his undergraduate studies at McAllister College and earned a doctorate in political science at the University of Minnesota. Mitau then returned to McAllister and under his leadership, McAllister's new political science department flowered into one of the most preeminent at the college and soon generated both state and national attention, given its association with Hubert Humphrey, Mitau's colleague, and Walter Mondale, a student of both. Unlike older German academic expatriates who were formed in a tradition at once culturally brilliant but politically and pedagogically autocratic, Mitau fully embraced American democratic institutions and values. His scholarship interests largely centered on US politics, primarily the areas of state and local government and the Supreme Court. He also led a rigorous and engaged public life consulting governmental agencies, commissions and committees, as well as public service associations throughout the region. The Mitau family and other generous donors make it possible so that this evening we can engage with Dr. Willoughby Harrard. Our guest tonight is in a long line of notable public intellectuals who have come to give the Mitau lecture such as Lonnie Guineer, Orlando Patterson, and Howard Zinn. Tonight's speaker, Tiffany Willoughby Harrard, is on the faculty in African American Studies at the University of California, Irvine. On March 13th, I had the privilege of watching Tiffany's induction as the 52nd president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. The National Conference of Black Political Scientists is organized to study, enhance, and promote the political aspirations of people of African descent in the United States and throughout the world. She is an interdisciplinary and humanistically oriented Black political scientist. When she gave her acceptance speech, this was evident in that she cited June Jordan's poem, A Poem for My Rights. She shared, I am not wrong, Wrong is not my name. My name is my own, my own, my own. And I can't tell you who the hell set things up like this, but I can tell you that from now on, my resistance, my simple and daily and nightly self-determination may very well cost you your life. If Tiffany is wrong, many of us do not wanna be right. 
Her current work explores cross-generational political organizing around issues of enduring concern in South Africa and led by young people. She's the author of the 2015 book, Waste of a White Skin, The Carnegie Corporation and the Racial Logic of White Vulnerability. Not only is she on the faculty of UC Irvine, she's also the special assistant to, to the Dean of Humanities for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusive Excellence. She's a poet, a mentor, an editor, a reader, a mama, a member of a church choir, a teacher, a discerning warrior, and a black internationalist, lesbian feminist who survived. Tiffany says she is not busy, she is in a divine flow. I am pleased to call her a friend. Please help me welcome Professor Tiffany Willoughby Harrard. Thank you so much to Professor Duchess Harris, uh, Andrew Latham, Diana Paz Garcia, Alexandra O'Farrell, and Rock Park. And I am honored to be with you from uh, the Ahachiman and Tongva land in this place that calls itself Irvine, California. The Ahachiman and Tongva peoples who in the face of ongoing settler colonialism continue to claim their place and act as stewards of their ancestral lands that they have for the past 8,000 years. The region extends from the Santa Ana River to Aliso Creek and beyond. I am just so delighted to be with you all tonight. I'm honored to celebrate with you Jewish immigrant scholar, philanthropist, and founding McAllister political scientist, Theodore Mattel. This paper is dedicated to the thriving and survival of medical doctor, World War II service member, chemist and historian, Catherine Lealtad, McAllister class of 1915. I join the many community researchers, young people, archivists, alumni, and non-academics who certainly are very interested in seeing McAllister lift up both Ms. Lealtad's name and life, but also I look forward with all of these people to seeing the tenuring of many dozens more Black women in every field on your campus. In 1995, three Black women historians, Darlene Clark Hine, Wilma King, and Linda Reed, edited and published a field building anthology entitled, We Specialize in the Holy Impossible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Their book echoed Akasha Gloria Hall, Patricia Bell Scott, and Barbara Smith's book, All of the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave. Such enduring contributions to a collectivist project of knowledge production in Black women's studies have to be brought into the room. And I call them in through a type of invocation. Because it was such projects, the first all-female Black women-led editorial board of a national refereed academic political science journal, the National Review of Black Politics, that gave me the opportunity to work with your own beloved Professor Duchess Harris, an American studies scholar, a political science scholar, a digital humanities scholar, a scholar of public-facing histories, an attorney and the mother of two amazing kids. This paper offers a generative new way for understanding and fighting Afrophobia. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen with you all. <clears throat> So Afrophobia is a curious shorthand for the lethal and shame-inducing war on African immigrants in contemporary South Africa. In his study of Afrophobia, scholar Francis Nyamjo finds that, quote, 
in South Africa, anti-immigrant sentiment is both strong and extremely widespread, cutting across virtually every socioeconomic and demographic group. While scholarship on this social phenomena has focused on, one, the lived experiences of migrants and refugees from the African continent, two, the ongoing experiences of low level informal economy, often dubbed criminality that targets everyone residing in the country, making xenophobia often a distracting and noxious misnomer. And three, the observation that such violence rarely targets people of European descent. Almost never does the commentary about Afrophobia turn to sustained attention toward the two centuries of racialized history of recruitment and manipulation of African migrant labor and the four centuries of land theft. This long history of commodification of human beings through racialized and specifically anti-Black labor recruitment and the making of the working class through a racial labor hierarchy compels us to understand Afrophobia differently. Now that term, a racial labor hierarchy, I wanna actually show you an example of what I mean by that. So the New York Times has been following, you know, once we turned the national debate around Colin Kaepernick and other athletes protest against police brutality into something that actually needed to be addressed, the New York Times and other newspapers have begun to look at racial labor hierarchy, at least by other names. And what you find if you search for images about racial labor hierarchy in athletics, what you find is so many images that focus on the highest paid athletes, because somehow the idea of people being paid ex exorbitant amounts of money for athletic uh, work seems to not be as valued. But it's very, very hard to find images that actually point to the difference in amount of money and the placement in our labor system of stratification that actually addresses the difference between how much people are making if they're in management versus whether or not they are athletes. And so I, I like this example of what I'm calling a racial labor hierarchy. So racializing African people as perpetual foreigners to South Africa and as people who were believed to owe unpaid and humiliating service to a white minority led society in the country of their birth has played an essential role in consolidating this society as a political territory. This process of racializing African people as perpetual foreigners and as bondsmen in the land of their birth, which linguists, archeologists and legal philosophers have convincingly called a zania in order to call into question the legality of the political territory that calls itself South Africa. This process of racializing African people has occurred to both those born within the stolen territory and those born elsewhere on the African continent. While South Africa has drawn laborers from all over the world for four centuries, the particular form of xenophobic violence unleashed there in 2008, 2015, and 2019 has targeted working poor and refugee African migrants. In addition to offering a structural analysis of racialized labor as an explanation for Afrophobia, I ask us to think about the ways that Afrophobia undercuts Pan-Africanist and Black internationalist visions of economic justice, articulated in the anti-apartheid activism of both African and African diaspora activists in the early 1960s. My work and the chapter of the book that I'm writing that this paper is part of is a chance to recover Pan-Africanism and African nationalism as a set of macroeconomic philosophies where development was essential in a way that could benefit even this post-1994 generation in South Africa the so-called born freeze, 
you know, derisively called that because their parents say they're so privileged, they don't really know what it means to struggle for freedom. And so in 2014 and 2015 and 2016 and 2017 and 2018 and 2019 and 2020, when young people in South Africa protested against the presence of fees at the university because they were attended to the fact that unemployment in their society was still kissing 50%, their parents looked upon them with derision and said, this is not a real struggle. And that compelled me to want to spend more time with these young people activists and perhaps contribute as what sociologist Belinda Robnett calls being part of the bridge generation that can help articulate their activism to their parents. In the larger book, this is part of, I analyze the experiences of three diaspora activists whose roles as researchers and educators enabled them to participate in African decolonization. I also analyze the history of the programs that brought them to key sites in the geography of the anti-apartheid black world, Southern Rhodesia, Uganda, and black England. I turn towards studying Afrophobia through diaspora activist educators, Cedric Robinson, Shelby Lewis, and Abebe Zageye, because their Pan-Africanism and their commitments to anti-colonial education and cross-generational political education work and their use of multiple writing genres offer a new set of insights about how we might begin to challenge Afrophobia. So what if we stopped thinking about Afrophobia as just a recurring situation that causes lots of problems to uh, African immigrants living in South Africa? And what if we started to think about it historically? Political theorist Cedric Robinson traveled his travels from Jim Crow, California to colonial Rhodesia. Africana womanist Shelby Lewis's travels from Jim Crow, Louisiana to colonial Tanganyika. Sociologist of knowledge Abebe Zegeya's travels from Civil War Ethiopia to the United States to London taken together shape their deep comprehension about why fighting racial colonialism, wherever it appeared, was relevant to their own lives. Living within vivid and distinctive forms of linked global white supremacy in very different societies and regions of the world, their complex analysis of racial segregationism and racial colonialism drew them into decades of life-changing commitment to the anti-apartheid struggle as one of many sites of the suppression of human freedom. To that end, Robinson, Lewis, and Zegeye did not fetishize apartheid as exceptional, nor did they fetishize it as the worst set of conditions for African people on the planet. Rather, they have written about apartheid as one form of the bureaucratic administrative application of anti-Black, cis-heteropatriarchal imposing racial settler colonialism. Therefore, these activist scholars have been particularly allergic to the emergence of Afrophobia and the narrative of a post-apartheid South Africa as a peculiar national exception, somehow immune to neocolonialism. So what about these frames, these concepts, Pan-Africanism, Black internationalism, what is meant by that? Pan-Africanism and Black internationalism and the people who have championed them are particularly useful political ideas for confronting and examining this history of racializing African people and assigning us to enclosed and captive geographies. To be clear, while the Pan-Africanism inaugurated in negritude literary and cultural festivals and Du Bois convened Pan-African conferences and the global Garveyite press and migration around the early 1900s to the interwar period is one temporal definition of Pan-Africanism. But I mean by Pan-Africanism something far broader in scope in that contributes to the type of world making that Adam Gadachu and Hakim Adi have written about. Adam Gadachu's 2019 book, World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination, 
marks a temporal scale of Pan-Africanism that takes us from Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah in 1957 to Trinidad and Tobago's Eric Williams in 1964 to Jamaica's Michael Manley in 1974. Hakeem Adi's 2018 book, Pan-Africanism, A History, demonstrates the necessity of an all-encompassing definition of the term to, quote, include all ideologies and movements that have at their center the notion of the unity and advancement of Africa and its diaspora, end quote. In particular moments of a heightened or more intentional emergence of Pan-Africanism as Paris-based Black internationalism, we witness actually one river with many streams and currents, according to Hakim Adi, that draws African continental knowledge production and African diasporic-based knowledge production into communion about their special obligations to reflect on and contribute to, quote, the ideas, activities, organizations, and movements that resisted the exploitation and oppression for all those of African heritage, that opposed and refuted the ideologies of anti-African racism and celebrated African achievement, history, and the very notion of being African, end quote. For Hakim Adi, the term Pan-Africanism pours out libations for 18th century activists like Alato Equiano and Otabuk Guano and 21st century activists like Chief M.K. Abiola, convener of the 1990 International Conference on Reparations for Africa and Africans in the Diaspora to the 1993 Abuja Proclamation that launched the modern day reparations movement. The World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance held in Durban in 2001, and the 2015 to 2024 United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent. All of this time-bending, space-bending practice calls us to account for what we have contributed it is precisely in this vein that my research seeks to remind us of Pan-Africanism as a repository of thought against white supremacy and as a repository of thought that compels us to reckon with the meaning of our history as peoples and as a people in the world. In the book chapter that this paper is part of, I reflect on how the promise of decolonization and ending Jim Crow inspired Black people's movements across and in defiance of the artificial territories and the often terrorizing national boundaries and biometric matrices of white minority government. Pan-Africanism then has offered us much in terms of theoretical and methodological frameworks for analyzing the long history of manipulated and captive migrant labor. This attention to economic exploitation and racial capitalism has also interrogated the long reliance on right-wing intelligence agencies and fascist vigilante groups to one, initiate violence among migrants, two, demobilize pan-ethnic workplace rebellions, and three, prop up the violent state-led restriction of outlets for organized mass action for economic justice. Section two. Education-focused anti-apartheid political organizing by diaspora activists. I assemble the reminiscences and writings and interviews with political theorist Cedric Robinson, focusing on his 1962 Operation Crossroads Africa experience, Africana womanist Shelby Lewis, and her 1963 experience with the British Teachers for East Africa organization and philosopher and academic press editor Abebe Zegea's 1988 to 1993 experience with the Oxfordshire County Council and the African Caribbean Adult Education Program, as well as his work in South African higher education from 1996 to 2011. These writings, reflections, and the interviews I have conducted with Louis and Zegea demonstrate significant contributions to the Black Studies movement in North America and Africa. The proliferation of Pan-Africanist feminist and proto-feminist activist ideas in higher education, 
and their recruitment of Pan-Africanist movement-led culture workers through education. Remembering the contributions of this particular group of thinkers is particularly important because they demonstrate how many historical erasures are being perpetrated by xenophobic violence in the post-1994 period. A set of erasures that have enabled the violence of the present. Taken together, the chapter then is about the kinds of diaspora, anti-apartheid, anti-colonial advocacy taken up to end apartheid between 1962 and 2011, a period of grave significance. Over this short period, South African society went from being the object of black and white protest around the world to a place that became again, the darling of the descendants and beneficiaries of settler colonialism in Southern Africa. Cedric Robinson's travels, Shelby Lewis's travels, Abebe Zegea's travels, all of these things will help us account for the range of education focused anti-apartheid political organizing by diaspora activists. These essential cases have not been documented by others as an assemblage, and yet they mark the making of lifelong commitments to Pan-Africanism and Pan-African institution building. Their work decolonized the conditions of independent Africa. Such decades of participation and commitment and the transformation of these scholar activists in to movement people had much to do with their ability to recognize the struggle against the legacies of racial colonialism, land theft and slavery as being part of a continuum of systemic violence. Their work raises questions about how South African exceptionalism operates with neoliberalism as the cornerstone and ideological cover for the real forces that benefit from Afrophobia. Bringing this particular cadre of diaspora activists together points to moments in which young Africans and young diaspora Africans built a complex political vision together. Unlike the present moment, when such political solidarities and alliances are misremembered or not remembered at all, these kinds of activists trouble Afrophobia and raise questions about where Afrophobia is really coming from and who actually benefits from it. Such activist scholars working in higher education expanded and created space for knowledge production by radicals in the anti-colonial struggle. These three figures also account for and frame a friendship network linked through a long relationship to transformation in higher ed through their Pan-Africanist and Black internationalist challenges to settler colonial logics, discourses, and rhetorics about citizenship and belonging. Without this kind of understanding of the history of diaspora-based activists and scholars, we may miss many of the social and economic dynamics that shape post-apartheid in this stage of the transition. So what I'll share with you tonight, because I am protecting the chapter for publication, it's under a kind of embargo, is Cedric Robinson's writings from his trip in 1962. I will interpret for you the Bulawayo Journal, which was produced by his cohort of Operation Crossroads Africa students against and in conversation with news stories and letters to the editor in the Rhodesian Chronicle, the official local paper. While the former evidences a flamboyant critique of globe-trotting racial segregationism and white minority rule, the latter, meaning the Chronicle newspaper, featured letters to the editor that were full of paternalistic warnings to the students and rhetorical strategies meant to stamp independent Zimbabwe as a miscarriage. This critical comparison positions Black internationalism and Pan-Africanism against the strict parameters on what independent Zimbabwe was imagined to be in the hands of competing systems of white minority rule. U.S. influence claimed that it had produced liberal, racially progressive, and multiracial American culture that could provide a model for how post-colonial Zimbabwe could manage a history of racial colonialism, forced labor, and land theft, 
without actually changing those structures. Indeed, running errands together as quote, multiracial shoppers or perhaps loud mouthed Americans, according to the Blue Ohio Journal, proved a stare yielding noteworthy cultural exchange experience. Rhodesia's white settler population insisted on its own provenance, possession, autochthony, and success at having painstakingly civilized its African charges. Sending its own young Americans to decolonize Africa, programs like Operation Crossroads Africa were paradoxically dispatching a force that was intended to amplify moderate, liberal individualistic tendencies against the pro-independence, anti-colonial, African-led Zimbabwe African People's Union, or ZAPU. With American friends like these, who needed enemies? Always underestimated in such calculations of ever-evolving forms of white guardianship over racialized people, was the persistence of what Cedric Robinson later described as the Black radical tradition, an expression of historical force and defiance that Robinson traced over millennia. Studying what Robinson does with this experience, like the other figures I engage with in this chapter constitutes a deployment of the kind of cross-generational radical impossibility that helps me articulate this historical process. Rather than producing subjectivities of moderation and passivity, encounters with African people Africanized the American personnel. As scholar activists cited in higher education and beyond it, Africa's disgorged and committed stolen descendants and members use their lives and writings to demonstrate why and how higher education continues to be a contested space for fighting racial colonialism, apartheid, and Jim Crow, and all the places where white supremacist racial state making rear their heads. Put plainly, in my analysis, Afrophobia is an odious tool of divide and conquer, both in the domestic South African context where it provides an ideological basis for harming African people from other societies, but also in the fact that it aids in erasing South Africa as part of a larger pan-Africanist struggle against racial colonialism of all types. Afrophobia actually produces a suppression of a certain history and a part of that struggle, which has been marginalized by contemporary South African political elites. Section four, South African exceptionalism. What I am suggesting is that national exceptionalism in general and South African exceptionalism in particular has a tendency toward racialized immigration restriction along with other forms of domestic focused racial segregationism. Neoliberal economies rely heavily on recruiting racialized and gendered immigrant workers and typically generate dense schemas of racial stigma and caricature to blame them for the repeated shocks and precarity of capitalism. It was this very specific understanding and framing of the problematics of racial segregationism enshrined in Pan-Africanism that have been suppressed and erased in the necessary rush to consolidate South Africa as a rainbow nation of post-apartheid exceptionalism par excellence. One of the intentional or unconscious byproducts of tethering the post-apartheid neoliberal consensus and government to South Africa's national exceptionalism has been to reinforce the marginalization of Pan-Africanism as a site for policymaking. Put a different way, suppressing Pan-Africanist ideology has had a series of deeply negative effects, ranging from limiting the vision of what kinds of macroeconomic policies are actually viable to a knee-jerk skepticism about regional and continent-wide economic integration. Instead, the South African state has focused almost exclusively on economic integration with the United States, Europe, and China. 
This means that a set of economic paths for macroeconomic redistribution have been deliberately obscured. And I think about this, um, uh, about the kind of uh, policy making that's taking place in the Biden administration right now. Regardless of what uh, political party one is a member of, certainly we can agree that it is better for government to do things than for government to do nothing. A government that does things actually has a shot at dealing with the problems that people are facing. I am offering a pan-Africanist economic analysis of apartheid and post-apartheid and situating South Africa back into a black world critical of racial capitalism. Even though South Africa's elite and government has offered it up and made it readily available for incorporation into the neoliberal global economy. A global economy based on a depoliticized populace, a tourism-based development model, and a credit and financialization-based development model that has ultimately made their economy more vulnerable and more precarious. Despite South Africa's African population being locked out of opportunity, they have been mobilized time and again, representing a group that has fallen for, quote, the rhetoric of abundance and success that is possible allegedly only if African immigrants from other countries are excluded. African immigrants are rendered as thieves and criminals in South African society, made vulnerable to regular and nearly monthly macroeconomic shocks the tens of millions of people who never received any kind of a post-apartheid economic dispensation are told that the poverty that haunts them, whether it's poverty while they're working for wages or poverty while they're waiting on social welfare relief or poverty that continues to extend itself across barter economies and across the informal economy, those people who are made economically and racially economically precarious are told that that is caused by African immigrants. These dynamics have prevented the possibility of deep macroeconomic restructuring to end poverty, create jobs, expand and bridge training opportunities to available jobs, and address the discriminatory and violently gendered labor divide. What am I saying? I'm saying that post-apartheid South Africa at a macroeconomic level looks very similar to apartheid South Africa. Using examples of earlier youth-led pan-Africanist mobilization from the era of formal decolonization struggles and the era of formal attempts to challenge Jim Crow enables me to stage a critique of Afrophobia. It is my contention that Afrophobia is one of the most useful weapons in the arsenal of neoliberal South African exceptionalism. Despite quarterly televisual rituals of screenings of superficial struggle documentaries, despite ever expanding levels of wealth inequality and unemployment, and despite personal security being something that no one can take for granted, young South African people have organized sustained marches and protests to demand housing, to stop rape and gender-based violence, to eliminate fees from higher education, and have organized a fully articulated political party focused on the return of land as the basis for the end of crushing wealth and income inequality. Rather than imagining themselves to be the mythic born free generation, the approach that I am calling another way gives us the chance to provide a better account of the cognitive dissonance that has erupted around the emergence of the economic freedom fighters founded in 2013. Criticized as political entrepreneurs and charlatans, the Louis Vuitton slipper wearing Julius Malema, the outspoken public representative of that organization, 
has been condemned for his contradictions and his willingness to publicly repudiate the African National Congress for not producing sustained economic transformation in 26 years. The Economic Freedom Fighters Party secures huge number of attendees at their rallies, has had a decisive sway on provincial and local elections, and represents more than a sense of comparative disadvantage in a country with some of the greatest wealth inequality statistics on the planet. I'll note that fewer than 1% of people on the African continent have received the COVID vaccine. This is the kind of precarity that I'm talking about. The EFF political party is able to hail constituencies and has a deep appeal because of its movement oriented approach to racial labor hierarchy and its willingness to amplify the voices of young people who are living within the contradictions and paradoxes of being told by their parents that their freedom has been handed to them and the truth that they know that no generation can hand freedom to the next. Every generation has to work for freedom and advocate it. For almost a decade, the organizing against racial labor hierarchy has also taken on and scrutinized privatization and neoliberal policies. Commentators write about youth-led protests as if they are startling, unexpected, and impossible. But given the economic conditions, these protests provide consolation and hope to many. That such pan-Africanist political education has been transmitted across generations and or has erupted among young people has been caricatured as apolitical and naive. It has been caricatured in ways that almost would make us believe that this generation has forgotten its own experience of decolonizing the mind. The larger project offers this reconsideration of Pan-Africanist political education and its long arc. Further, I argue that the ideas about economic transformation and the violence of gendered racial labor hierarchy have been popularized among young contemporary activists who really are the primary bulwark against neoliberal entrance and state collapse. So I'm gonna move on quickly to a discussion of the actual cases. So Cedric Robinson's writings and experiences paired against local news coverage about the six week 1962 Operation Crossroads trip to Southern Rhodesia helps me systematically gather together a critique of the very, very, very angry news stories that were produced during the time when he and other American students were visiting Southern Rhodesia. The Southern Rhodesia Chronicle um, literally provided accounts, uh, kind of like the one I have here is a quotation. Um, and I'll read the quotation aloud kind of as a way of universal design. Quote, the Rhodesians have proved themselves very capable of carrying out their duties of looking after the Africans' health, education, et cetera, and per head have provided more money for African public services than the Americans have for the whole of Africa. And we don't shout, yell, and scream about it. In this particular commentary letter to the editor, along with the others that I'll share with you all briefly, you get a sense that the Rhodesian uh, host of this group of students was zealous to make sure that the students from the United States were not interested in meeting up with any African nationalists, with any of the people who were part of the anti-colonial struggle that ultimately uh, resulted in an independent Rhodesia. When the Rhodesian hosts realized that the student ambassadors with American, Canadian, Mexican, and British passports supported pulling white minority rule out by the roots and replacing it with a new geography called Zimbabwe, the Operation Crossroads Africa students were roundly castigated and charged with being unwitting pawns for superpower politics. 
But their interlocutors were not only African nationalist movement and political party organizers, they were also navigating the potential volatile dynamics in their interactions with non-African residents in Zimbabwe and society who wanted to be seen as participants in the trend toward the decolonizing ethos of the winds of change, even if their society was built on the dictates of 19th century racial colonialism. The Crossroaders, in response to the news press and also out of a sense of working collectively, established a practice as students of gathering every day to do political education to come together across what we might call a kitchen table and describe in detail where they had gone, what they had experienced, what it was like going to Zimbabwe and building a school, what it was like to interact with the African people that they encountered, what it was like to interact with the white and Asian people that they met in that community. What did it actually mean for them to be there? And through journaling collectively, literally this group of students, each night, one person would be the scribe. And when all of the notes were taken together, they had about a 30 page document that they called the Bulawayo Journal. So for the students in the audience, I wanna really say, please don't ever underestimate the power of journaling with other people in your ability to share information. I like to read these two documents against each other because it's almost like they're talking about two different worlds and the, the object of study, the object being analyzed in the midst of it is this group of American students and their willingness to critique um, the politics of racial violence inside their own society and inside the future Zimbabwe. The Crossroaders had the chance to meet everyday upwardly mobile African people dwelling in the 1,500 person home ownership African township of Shabalala, where they were scheduled to live and work and build a school. The newspaper account of the Crossroaders visit would have us focus only on the tete a tete between quote unquote idealistic young American champions for racial liberal progress and Rhodesians characterizing their society as another variant of a harmonious post-World War II multiracial one. But the Bulawayo Journal, produced by the visiting students, reveals genuine dissidence with colonial segregationism and indicates that like their civil rights movement friends back in North America, both Zimbabwe and the United States still were in the midst of the long, hard turmoil to achieve and secure independence for Africa's people. While their classmates were registering people to vote and violating segregation law through integrating buses, political parties, the banking and insurance industry, universities and neighborhoods, the authors of the Bulawayo Journal evidence a sensibility that read Zimbabwe and Alabama as part of a linked fratricidal racial colonial battlefield. In the journal, the visiting students observed Shabalala's residents, their adopted town and its accoutrements and a dynamic two-way relationality where their African hosts were observing them as well and regarding them as objects of curiosity and people who they generally were amused by. Their enthusiastic African hosts used the occasion of their presence to organize visits, teach snippets of Indebele, and to choose which of the crossroaders was their favorite. The most pointed self-critique from the crossroaders came with their expressions of doubt about, quote, the school site having already been meticulously planned with foundation already dug out. Straight walls, sharp corners, and unmixed cement couldn't possibly be beyond the resources of Southern Rhodesia. The crossroaders worried in their journal about what kind of value their contribution could actually be. And in the Chronicle, we find consistently a kind of bleak distaste for anyone else being involved in what the Rhodesian writers typically refer to as their own African business. I share as I close this kind of account with you all because I want us to think about what it means to not expect resistance from young people 
And I'd like us all to think about what it means to minimize the political work that young people are engaged in. Um, in my own research and studies, my goal is to try to think across generations politically, to think about political socialization and to think about what kinds of harm particular moments of violence emerge from. Telling a story about Afrophobia that suggests that it's only something of the present erases the power of Pan-Africanism and the kind of work that is available to us and that continues to this day. To the 30 million people who participated in the protests against the, the, the murder of Mr. George Floyd, um, and to the folks who stood up against fascism in this country and almost every other country on the planet in 2020 and still in 2021, and to the memory of Theodore Mattel and Catherine Leal Todd, I offer my research. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Tiffany Willoughby Harard. Um, I would love to join you in a conversation now. We have a question from the audience that asks, is Afrophobia a kind of hangover from the apartheid era? Or is it a new project tied into the construction of a post-apartheid nation building? That's a really good question about whether Afrophobia is new or whether it's old. Um, I think I'm arguing a little bit of both, um, on, you know, quite purposefully. I don't have any investment in being a young Turk that has to come up with a new term and has to make something that's totally different. I'm actually more interested in making sure that this particular form of violence is analyzed in a historical context. And so, it's new in the sense that South Africa wasn't a convincing political, it couldn't convince the rest of the world in the post-World War II period that its model of uh, managing multiracial society was ethical, right? Um, all parts of the world had protests against South Africa governments, you know, longshoremen protested, people all over the world. It was not convincing to argue that apartheid was a reasonable kind of model, that racial labor hierarchy was an important kind of model um, that should be acceptable to the rest of the world. Even though it was like well into the 1990s in our country that Congressional Quarterly referred to the African National Congress as terrorists, right? The US Congressional Quarterly. So on the one hand, I'm trying to cite Afrophobia as part of a longer history of racial labor hierarchy. But I'm also trying to now acknowledge the fact that legally, constitutionally, apartheid has ended. And yet apartheid dealt with a set of structural laws and racial ideologies. It never dealt with conquest, right? It didn't deal with the return of the land. It didn't deal with the fact that racial labor hierarchy relies on um, gendered racial violence. It didn't, it didn't deal with those things. And so it, it's, a, it's a kind of a both and answer. I hope that's helpful, but thank you for that question. I'm writing it down. Do black South African intellectuals contribute to or challenge the Afrophobia narrative? Yeah, that's a really good question. It really depends on which folks you're dealing with, right? Um, I think for, you know, I deal with a lot of philosophers. Um, and so that's kind of the set of conversations that I'm in. Um, philosophers and um, people who are part of the Pan-Africanist uh, Congress, you know, people who are, are movement people. And that um, group has consistently had one or two people um, in the legislature, in the judiciary, and, um, but they have uh, a very powerful advocate um, and a scholar whose name I'll put in the chat, um, who is kind of like uh, Professor Harris, a kind of polymath, uh, Renaissance person. 
Um, Motseko uh, Peku has published, I don't know, probably 40 books. Um, the young man is in his 80s and writes um, every day. He has a very disciplined writing practice. And he writes about um, everything related to Pan-Africanism. And it's really his work. You know, this is so, he's not a, a, a young South African intellectual, but he's an incredibly living and um, an active South African intellectual who is really trying to get us to think about the benefits of Pan-Africanism. What could Pan-Africanism bring? What could Pan-Africanism bring? And so that means if that's a leading intellectual, the account that somebody like Dr. Peku or somebody like philosopher Indomiso Dladla, um, that they bring to bear is really one that wants us to think about xenophobia in a more, uh, a more careful and systematic kind of way. Um, I won't make light or minimize in any way, shape or form what it is like um, to be in South Africa during one of these moments of xenophobic scourge. In fact, we are right on the cusp of one here, right? depending on how the Biden-Harris administration handles the surge at the border right now, we'll either have an account about humanitarianism or an account about how things are, are too bad here to absorb populations. So that, that's what I'll say to that question. Okay, great. Um, our next question is, um, the person who writes says, I agree that post-apartheid South Africa looks very much like apartheid. Is the Zondo Commission effective? How has co corruption contributed to this decline and pitting people against each other? Yeah, so um, corruption is nothing new. Um, there are wonderful World Bank and United Nations um, indexes that call for us to measure the corruption index around the world. One of the problems with the corruption index is they always start from the presumption that there has not been any corruption prior and there's no need to really pay any attention to the basic corruption that operates anytime you have a nation state um, that's run by wealthy people, supposedly for the benefit of not wealthy people. And so, Corruption is a, is a real problem, but I think what's also a real problem is the level of indebtedness. Um, there's a very high level of indebtedness. And so in some ways, like we might think about contemporary South Africa as a kind of a credit card nation. You know, if all the banks called in the debt, um, there's a real likelihood that we could, you know, be facing something like state collapse. So that's that's the kind of stuff that I'm I'm concerned with. Yeah. Okay. And, and is the Zondo Commission effective? Sometimes you'll only know if something is effective a really long, long time. You know, you won't necessarily know if it's effective in the process. I know that there has been a lot of scrutiny and attention to it. And as a political scientist, I think that's an incredibly important process. It's very important for us to be watching, talking about, and debating. Um, what interventions government is doing to try to edit itself. But you know, we have these kinds of processes like we have police commissions, right? We have um, PTAs that are supposed to be regulating government employees' behavior. And I don't know that the Zondo Commission has a parallel kind of workers' budget that has the capacity to evaluate corruption. Right? What does it mean to have people-led, people-centered uh, policy think tanks that can look at um, the economic inequality that's being created by state capture? Okay, so we have a question from a student who's writing from Swaziland. And she writes, thank you so much for your perspective. You talked about the EFF and I wonder if you picture its criticism towards Afrophobia as being from the pushback of the older generations refusing to do more work in its causes or trying to bring a fight 
that will also include those generations. Um, more critiques seem to talk of it as solely based on the youth. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really, um, a very easy kind of um, accusations about the EFF. And I, I'm not like, th the reason why I, I mentioned, you know, the Louis Vuitton slipper wearing kind of stuff that um, Julius Malema gets up to is because I think that as a political figure, there is a lot of political education even he has yet to, to go through, right? But what I appreciate about the EFF is the heart of what they're doing is not uh, a focus on how can we rectify this constitution that doesn't deal with conquest. The heart of even their name is the problem is economic. The problem is that the next generation has to be able to, to mobilize itself as making some decisions and making some political moves about um, freedom. Every generation has to do that for itself. And so sometimes you get a kind of knee jerk dismissal of EFF, but I don't think people are just naive when they join it. I don't think they've had the kind of sway that they've had over elections by mistake. I don't think it's by mistake. I th think they're actually creating space for people um, who are members of unions and for those people who are in professions that are not unionized and they hail both of those audiences. So what do we do with the fact that they're hailing these disparate audiences that are not supposed to be on the same side, right? There's plenty of people in the EFF who are professionals who are concerned about the quote unquote black tax, right? As well as there are folks who have been unemployed for a very long time. And so I don't know that the EFF will, will, you know, will keep moving, will keep moving, will keep being sustainable in the same way. But it is really important that rhetorically they will show up in the parliament and name sets of processes and policies that are very, very harmful. That because, you know, elites from the earlier generation have made these brokered deals and negotiated settlements. You know, they're like, well, we got to protect our interests. Well, you know, we know that that thing is compromised, but, you know, if we, if we disappoint, you know, X, Y, or Z industry or X, Y, or Z country, they're not going to be willing to trade with us anymore. And I think that's short-sighted. And I appreciate the EFF and I will always appreciate them, even though I have, I will get into big battles with my friends in the PAC um, around this issue. I appreciate them for naming economics. And I think it's important. And I don't think they're doing it just because everybody wants to be riding around in Louis Vuitton slippers. Well, our next question is related to economics. You are the 41st MeTow lecturer. Mm -hmm. And the 40th lecture was done by professors Mullen and Dor um, Dar um, Darity. And they spoke about reparations in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we have someone who'd like to know if there's a similar movement in South Africa. Yeah. So the closest thing I can say is the folks who are organizing around the naming of the country as a Zania. Um, the EFF and a lot of other organizations, um, there's a land first movement. Um, that's very, very interested in the return of the land. That whenever you say, what is the state of South Africa? They say the constitution that we're living under, the constitution does not deal with the land question. And I put in the chat the names of, you know, two thinkers that I really admire quite a bit um, and whose work really animates my own. And so I, I want to make sure that people look those names up and order their books online or teach them if you want to get a handle on more about what's happening in South Africa. I think they have really insightful things to say. Okay, so our next question is, is Afrophobia so hardwired into post-apartheid South African identity? Mm -hmm. um, that it can't be displaced by pan-Africanism? I, 
I don't think um, I don't think there's anything so hardwired into um, social practice that can't be undone. Um, you know, colleagues of mine, you know, like Professor Harris, have been talking about self care as a practice for uh, you know academics for decades, like for literal decades, and it is now you know the, the historical conjuncture that we're in has made that important. Of course, it's a commodified version of it that gets sold back to us as get your nails done and you know, get a face beat and then you will feel better, right, about yourself. It's not the stuff that we were talking about, which is about um, practices of um, really undoing the world by uh, removing your labor, by <laughs> restricting yeah. um, you know, how your workplace and how society can treat you, refusing um, to the best of your ability to be treated as you know less than your dignity, and so that for me is a kind of uh, practice-based observation about how new ideas, old ideas, resurfacing ideas can always be made available again. And really, what's astonishing to me and why I'm writing this book is that the people who are my generation and 15 years older than me were so shocked by the roads must fall and the protests against the Americana massacre and the um, 2018 protest, um, the, it was called the total shutdown where people had um, posters that cited, I'm gonna cite this poem badly. They were citing poet Kaleka Patuma, um, you know, you know, God don't let me die, you know, with a gun in my mouth and my, my legs in the air. I'm citing the poem badly, right? Um, and other placards that said, you know, hashtag men are trash. I mean, to me, I was like, woo, that's that's very edgy. That's that's very edgy. But when you're living in a society that re refuses to find um, women and gender non-binary and um, you know trans women as credible in their accounts of violence that they experience or in their accounts of this is the history of this violence that refuses to see either the present or the past as credible, I'm gonna always expect resistance. I'm gonna always expect that ideas um, are shifting and have possibility. My dissertation advisor, the Cedric Robinson that I talked about, um, had this terminology called racial regimes. And um, whenever I read the word racial regimes, he articulates it, you know, very, unpacks it a lot in that book, uh, Forgeries of Memory and Meaning from I think 2014. And what he does <laughs> is he says that racial regimes are um, they're very fragile. They're very, very fragile. And it's kind of like you think of a house that's being flipped. The thing is like completely could collapse at any moment. And we're just doing rehab jobs on it. Every time we face a, a major historical conjuncture or history, we are believing that the thing is solid when it's all just made up of fragile patchwork. So what happens when we, um, you know, when we punch holes in the thing that's not solid? It's not made out of rock. It's not made out of stone. It's not made out of diamond. It's completely fragile. I'm so glad that you brought up Cedric Robinson. Um, there will definitely be people in the audience who do not know who he was. Um, he has passed away. Um, and they will not um, be familiar with his work. When you came to my class this afternoon, you explained to my students what racial capitalism was. Mm -hmm. If you could share that with this large, larger audience, I think that would be valuable. Yeah, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. I think forgeries is from 2007. I'm putting it in the chat. But somebody who's not trying to answer a question can look it up maybe for me. <laughs> But so we, we get ourselves in this trap about, particularly in this society, because we still haven't 
done the reckoning around our own um, history of conquest and our own history of racial subjection and violence. Like today, you know, you all are neighbors in Dakota country are literally um, having to hold, like the rest of the breath, the rest of the country is holding its breath based on how jurors in your state <laughs> make decisions, right? We're all like on bated breath because it could mean one direction for the society or another direction for the society. And I, I bring that up, you know, not to be cute or anything, but, but to be really pointed about um, how serious it is that we do political education with each other and not political education that's fascist, <laughs> you know, not white supremacist political education. But what Robinson helps us understand is that we're never in a battle between race and class. We just, we don't, that's just a fakery. It's not the truth. What Robinson argues for us is a notion of racial capitalism. The European nation state, as it is being uh, created and crafted, tells itself origin stories about how it's being developed, right? about how it's being developed. One of those origin stories is that a nation is a group of people that's all speaking the same language, has the same beliefs, is all the same way ethnically and racially. There's never been such a thing on the planet. That's, that's not actually a political configuration. Human history is people moving, moving, moving to lots of different kinds of places. So what he suggested about the origins of capitalism is that the origins of capitalism teach us that race and the making of races is how Europe created its nation states. Capitalism emerges and literally grafts itself on to that notion of nation making. So racial capitalism was his concept to help us never ever have to be in a debate about race versus class again. In fact, we need both of those things to be able to understand at minimum the complexity of the societies that we live in. I hope that helps. I'm a little tired now, guys. That was, that was tremendously helpful. And I know that you're tired, so this is gonna be our last question. And we're gonna come full circle and focus on South Africa. And the question is, does Pan-Africanism run into similar resistance in other parts of Africa or is South Africa specific and unique? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the way I will answer it is that like folks like this philosopher, Dr. Ndumiso Dladla, whose name I, thank you for letting me know that I was just speaking to the panelists. I'm saying, I'm putting all this stuff in the chat for you all. And I'm not, because I was only writing to the panelists. Um, people like him went to study at Dar es Salaam, you know? A lot of folks have to go and study outside of South African higher education, at least for one of their degrees, to be able to have access to a Pan-Africanist higher education. Um, in some ways, you might want to think about not all of higher education on the continent, because it's a really like widely diverse continent with different um, histories and funding strategies. So I wouldn't want to paint a broad brush. But within the context of higher ed in South Africa, even though there's been great transformation and production of more uh, PhDs um, among uh, African people, it is still a kind of, um, there's still a racial labor hierarchy happening in higher ed there that kind of mirrors our own. I teach for the University of California. Um, in the UC system, there's 500 or more tenured or tenure track political scientists. There are right now six, maybe seven um, black political scientists in the state of California UC system. And I thought for sure it'll be better in the California State University system or in the community colleges. It's worse, it's worse. So um, you, you get these little indications that a thing hasn't changed regardless of its rhetoric 
right? Where I teach, it's a Hispanic serving institution. It's a minority serving institution. Um, it's an anapesi institution, but there's still fewer than, you know, 2% um, black students self-identified, right? Because nobody gets to say what other people are, right? And I don't think there's 1% of native students. Like what set of policies happen that make that possible? In California, Proposition 209 is what made that possible. We lost, you know, 26 years of um, black and native um, scholars, right? That's, that's what that policy meant. And it meant because of how much money it takes to produce a political scientist that can do the kinds of things that, you know, Professor Latham and Professor Harris and that I can do, um, the decision meant to create basically a white color bar in higher ed in our state. That's why I opened with that kind of invocation of Catherine Leal Todd, because I, I need her, her spirit to, to drip down across this conversation and to spur some of the hearers to um, right action. Well, her spirit is with us and the political science department at McAllister does not have a racial bar. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the department chair, Paul Dosh. I would like to thank the members of the MeTown committee, Professor Andrew Latham and Professor Leslie Lavery. I'd also like to thank the department coordinator, Roxy Fisher. Um, this is the first time that the political science department has collaborated with the American Studies Department with the 40th and the 41st METAL lectures. And I'm a proud affiliate member of the Political Science Department here at McAllister. Professor Tiffany willoughby Harrard, you have blessed us this evening with your wisdom and your knowledge and the spirit that you brought to our campus, even though it's virtual. And I really hope that everyone has a lovely evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good night. Good night.